Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Amy Peck. I am the founder and CEO of Endeavor VR. Um, we're a strategy and consulting firm uh, working primarily with, with Fortune 500 companies on leveraging this technology. And um, I'd love to invite uh, my panel up. I think everybody's mic. So um, uh, Mia D. Joe uh, from Newport News Shipbuilding and uh, Jay Lada, who is the CEO uh, and founder of Stint. And still getting mic'd, but coming up shortly is Christian Clark, uh, who's working in R&D at Ford. Welcome. So while Christian is getting mic'd, um, I'd love for the two of you just to introduce, introduce yourselves just a little bit further. My name is Mia Joe, and I work for Newport News Shipbuilding. I'm a project manager who specializes in educational technology. I've been in training and development for close to 30 years, and I really enjoy um, enhancing learning with technology. My name is Jay Latta. I'm originally in, in automotive, but uh, Stint is my passion. It's a European progressive think tank. We are supporting several startups, also the industry, um, on, on uh, ideation, um, finding use cases, um, defining visions, stuff like this. We are also kind of uh, connected, well connected into European politics to support all of these uh, companies or raising startups um, to, to get on the right place and to, to be well connected. Uh, my name is Christian Clark with Ford Motor. I've worked with Ford for about eight years now. I'm part of a uh, research and development group for extended reality that looks at augmented reality, virtual reality, all of the genre in between, and where it can be applied in the business with a focus on B2B for things like manufacturing, warehouse processes. Great, I'd love to just canvas the audience. How many in the audience are from enterprise and actually looking at either SIM and training or other solutions utilizing XR? Okay, a good portion. And then any developers who are developing solutions to solve those problems? Nice. All right, we should all have a little mixer right after this. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, I'd love also each of you to, to, to talk a little bit um, about some specifics of things that you can share. Um, and we're all under friend EA here. Um, and, and some projects that you're working on uh, that are specific to this and um, just share a little bit about what you're working on. So yeah. All right, well, currently I am working on a project for the National Shipbuilding Research Program. This is an organization that is really a combined effort between the U.S. Navy and the shipbuilding and repair industry. The purpose of this particular collaboration is to join the research and development dollars for the industry with the goal to assist or lower the um, total cost of ownership for the U.S. Navy. So it's just kind of one way for the entire industry to come together and spend like money or cost shared money for research and development for that purpose. The project that I'm currently working on is a project to improve workforce development through augmented reality. And at Newport New Shipbuilding, we have a group of uh, an augmented reality team uh, that is made up of designers and developers and engineers. And we all come together and we go out into the uh, workforce to determine where augmented reality can be best used for the purposes of training. And uh, it's a really exciting project. We've, had, we've completed one phase and we've just started the second phase, which is the exciting time where we have an opportunity to test the applications that have been developed based on metrics and determine how effective the technology is towards improving learning. That's excellent, and Jay? Well, I'm supporting several use cases and, and several startups in the healthcare, for example. Um, the one is uh, dedicated to palliative medicine, where we use uh, AR glasses for uh, telediagnostics and telesupport and VR for last wishes, bucket list experiences. Um, 
in uh, healthcare, there is also a use case in uh, telesurgery, where we try to, to implement um, the real haptics behind when you simulate the, 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 um, the surgery and then to kind of let it run with an AI-driven um, surgical robot to uh, complete, for example, the stitches when, when, when the operation ends. Um, so these are these major two um, use cases from healthcare. Else I'm involved, for example, uh, in an AR helmet in uh, Germany um, for fire departments. Um, this is one very exciting thing. We'll see if, if, if it will uh, go how it is. Uh, for simulation, I've been supporting an uh, environment where you can set up these, these simulated um, situations for fire, firemen and to simulate all kind of dizziness, fog, uh, is burning something, a small kidney is running around, just what do I do with it, um, to prepare them on all of these unexpected situations. That's an excellent use case. And um, so at Ford, what are some of the things that, that you're working on? Uh, what I'm allowed to disclose is we look at all the kind of low-hanging fruit, all the use cases that come up throughout these conferences as being things that enterprise should look into, those being the see what I see, guided instructions, um, use for training. And we're either driven by a use case, someone will come to us with a specific uh, problem. We want to have an enhanced form of training or we want to be able to train someone from day one on some of our factory equipment and then we look at the available technology in the marketplace and decide what might be the best fit for that problem and then develop proof of concepts and small uh, pilots for that. Or we get a technology, VR came out, so we just got some VR, we buy a lot of the um, headsets, monoculars, binoculars, high immersion like a HoloLens, lower like a Vuzix, and then see where this might fit in the company for problems that we can see or just develop something and put it out there and show it to the company around and say, hey, does this give you an idea of somewhere where this technology might be used for you? So for like training, we look at, should we be doing this in VR and we might develop something in VR for training or outsource it to another smaller company or is 360 video a better approach to the type of training we're looking to do or a combination of those things? Mm -hmm. So we just kind of proof out wherever we see a need for the technology. So you opened with um, what I can share, and um, uh, you know I think uh, you know some of you in enterprise understand this challenge is that um, you know when doing the research and to be able to get buy-in, you need the data and you need to be able to show what the ROI is and what the metrics are. But because you know there's a lot of uh, kind of cloak and dagger in R and D teams, um, you know we don't always get public data for some of the internal. Um, workings and, and projects that large other large companies are doing. So there's this leap of faith and some have made it and aren't sharing and some won't make it until they get the data. And it's a little bit of a conundrum that we're working within. So I'd love to, to talk to each of you too and find out, you know, was it a leap of faith, you know, or did, you know, were you looking at other available data or government data that's been out there on the efficacy of, of XR technology? We know it's out there. Um, it's just very hard to kind of you know, coalesce all this information. Uh, absolutely, I I would have to say that initially, the um, the thought that the technology could really lend itself to learning was cold, to say the least. Uh, but I think that the industry for shipbuilding and repair has come around, and it appears as if there has been a realization that the technology can really lend itself to the type of learning that is needed for our industry. And uh, with that being the case, we've, we've had to go out and do some research, uh, look at the types of studies that have been conducted for the technology and the type of training that's needed. And unfortunately, there hasn't been a whole lot in the uh, industry for augmented reality and, or virtual reality, but there has been some for other industries. 
and we've taken that information and we've kind of matched it up to see if it would be beneficial for our industry. That's why this particular project that I'm working on is really good because not only does it provide us with the information that's needed at the other side of the training, but it will also provide information for the industry. So I think that that is something that's very important going forward. Um, we have some research out there, but it's important for us to do our own research for our particular industries to make sure that it is uh, gonna be beneficial for the type of content <coughs> that will be taught. Did I answer your question? No, you did, I did. And, and as soon as you get that information, please just like email all of us. No, we're not worried about the spam. Um, and Jay, what about, what about with, the, with all of your work? Well, <clears throat> we are here talking concerning XR about experimental technology. It's something, it's not that new, but it's still not kind of finished. It's nothing that you ju just, just pull out of a drawer and everyone can use it. So you are starting over and over and again and again on a green field and then setting up everything. If you are lucky, you have kind of data that you can use. Um, mostly you have to reinvent it to, 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 uh, to, well, to collect new data, especially in Europe, we are kind of paranoid uh, concerning data. So what we have to learn is to open up and to share this data. Right now, everyone just keeps it, and so you really have to, to, to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And at Ford, how did you get data to sort of prove out some of the projects that you wanted to initiate? Uh, getting data is always a challenge, um, not as much from a secrecy or just groups keeping it with themselves. It's that everyone says they have it, but once you actually try to get it is where you can't find specifically what you're looking for especially with dealing with things like CAD. Everyone says, oh, we know who has the CAD data, and they send you a link to them, and then you talk to them, and oh, no, no, I, I can get it for you, though. And then once you finally pin down the person that does have the data you're looking for, it's of too large of a file size to share through internally structured file sharing <laughs> services. So then you need to figure out a way to get these large files from point A to B. So it's not as much around the just legality or secrecy of data, it's just working within the existing infrastructure because like Jake I'm said, it was, it's not very new technology, but it's not quite there yet. And it's a lot of reinventing what you're doing while you're doing it and figuring out how to solve a problem when you stub your toe against it. Yeah, but the, I think the, the great thing about you know, using this technology for simulation and training is that this, that is one area where, where you know, the, the government's been using it for decades. It's how, you know, aviators learn um, to fly. And so I'd love to hear, you know, what, what are some of the successes? You know, what, do you have any metrics that you can share? You know I really want this data. I'm trying so hard. Um, <laughs> um, but we, but you know, what, are the, what, what have you found and, and what are some of the best programs that you found that you've initiated to, to, to help others in the industry? I have one for this. Um, one of the things that we were surprised and very glad about is just the adoption of the new technologies by especially some of our, what's the PC term for our more aged, uh, no, our veteran work group. There we go. <laughs> I think of that one. Um, that we don't want to spend a whole lot of time and money and effort into a big project making a fully blown out solution, giving it to a factory worker. They put it on, say this is big and heavy and stupid and take it off immediately. So when we do things and put somebody in VR, we're also looking for do they think it's bad or not like the VR controls or being in that environment or having an AR headset on? Or do they say, no, this is great and here's actually what I'm thinking for terms of training and get past that hurdle of a new technology. And we found that everyone's really adaptive and supportive of the AR VR whenever we bring it in for any of our use cases so far, it's been uh, met surprisingly well. I also think that it's really important for us to include the end user during the development process. Mm -hmm. That's something that we really make it a point to focus on. 
as we are designing the course, the instructional designers are designing the course, as part of that team, we have the end users participate in the development. And they are with us throughout the entire uh, duration of developing the course, clear through the pilot and to the end. That is an, that's an excellent point and, and piece of information um, in, in running pilot programs because it's amazing the things that you overlook because this is such new technology. And I think especially when you sort of live in it day to day, you forget what those early experiences are and you know the, the danger of introducing technology into a workflow um, you know, has you know, could have some profoundly negative effects, and so it, I think that's an, a really good approach. Um, and then, um, Jay, do you have any thoughts on data that you want to share, yes. or some of the, yes, the best of solutions you've really seen? My my biggest finding was that it's not helpful if you give such use cases. Use case is always important. Don't do nonsense. Find the proper use case, and to give such a use case to a tech guy to a bit head is a big mistake. You need to involve, because the end user is someone, human beings are very visual oriented animals. So you need to involve communication designers. You need to involve media psychologists to get the right informations displayed there. A tech guy can provide you with everything. It looks like a, like a graphic user interface with some text blocks in it and it's not helpful. It will just, just distract you, so you really need someone who understands how, how the human brain works to provide them the right visual informations. Mm. And then Christian, how are you doing that at Ford in terms of your user testing? Are you actually using users like on the floor or are you sort of taking them out and, and having them experience and give you feedback in a more controlled environment? Um, yeah, we try to get in the hands of the people that would be using it on the day-to-day -day job. Like Mia said, uh, just throughout all the development process, we like to have them there testing out whenever we make some changes to one of our tests. We then will bring it back to a plant or try to work with uh, one of the union members who would be using the tool and say, all right, what do you think about this change? Yes, no, how is it right, how is it wrong? And take it from there just to make sure it's fine-tuned to specifically solve the problem that we're trying to. That's great. And also, um, don't forget, I don't know if all of you have um, Slido, uh, but we will leave time for questions at the end so we can start um, thinking about what you want and put it on Slido and we'll uh, we'll get to it at the end. Um, so. You know, there, there's so much um, to, to this topic. Um, what, what, what are some of the, the kind of, what does the future hold for this? You know, what are, the, what are some of the things that you'd like to see? You know, you start to think of this confluence of technologies because it is this very kind of complex web of software and hardware and, and utility and, and workforce. What's next and what's, what do you feel and some of the projects that you're working on are really going to start to, to galvanize these initiatives so that they can really roll out on, on sort of a broader level? And Christian, why don't you start? Um, that's a good one. Uh, there's a f standardization is always good. Right now it seems like every device has their own interaction with their system. It's tapping, it's talking, it's swiping some controls that are over here, over here, a button on the top and the button on the bottom. And just sometimes that is built specifically for a problem that they're seeing a niche for to solve. But at the same time, everyone's on their own page. So going between devices, putting it on the average person. Uh, we have our HoloLens calisthenics, hold your finger out, put it up, put it down, this is how you select for this one. But for this device, you're gonna just talk to it. Um, would be a good thing to have available. Mm -hmm. And then also maybe just within large companies, there might not be the um, foundation even for these new technologies. Uh, odd problems to run into is when filling out the paperwork for adding new technology into the company, there's not a checkbox for XR devices. There's no AR, VR, so I have to then kind of figure out, is this a smartphone, I guess, or a personal computer? And then if not, it has to then go through legal for a while just so I can have that new field to fill in for a new technology that is hard to explain to someone who doesn't know what it is just over a phone or a group of emails. So just getting that base 
uh, space to build on top of and be able to incorporate technology a bit easier into systems that weren't um, originally thinking about it five years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jay, what about you? Well, standardization is, is of course, a very, uh, well, very good topic. It's, it's very important. Um, it goes down even to how we interact with these devices. It does, it, it, it's, it's nonsense if each of these devices has another kind of gesture. It must come down how we behave, how we, we interact with each other. This is what these devices have to learn how to read us. If I want to just to swipe kind of thing, it should go like this and not tipping somewhere or making whatever. Um, so this is, of course, one thing. The tech must adapt to the human to, to, to be of benefit and not bringing us to, to reshape us and to learn how we have to deal with the tech. And um, of course, um, it's also these use cases to, 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 to bring down the benefit of the tech to um, deconstruct our complex world so we can interact with our everyday work with each other on a more simplified way. Mm -hmm. And you've just been through this whole process. What's, what do you expect to find in this next round um, you know, for this project? Well, I think that um, what I've been focusing on mostly is trying to get a two-for-one type deal. Uh, training is very important. Uh, we can remove the individuals from an environment that is potentially unsafe and place them in a safe environment, but still give them the, the, the environment in an artificial type of, type of function. But on top of that, after training, we want to provide support as well on the job, which could be a dangerous type situation. So we're always looking at safety and considering safety. So when the applications are developed, they're developed with the thought that this application could possibly improve performance on the job. And so that forces us to keep, keep the, our minds on the fact that this application could potentially be used in an environment where they still need to be aware of their surroundings. Um, that's something that I've always thought was very important moving forward. So this particular um, project that I'm working on, we're moving into the pilot. The pilot will be conducted both. Some will be in the classroom, but some will also be on the job site because we want to get that data as well. Yeah, that's great. All right, let's throw up some of the questions and see how many we have so we can make sure that we have time to get to them all. Can we have the Slido screen? Okay, we just have one. Christian, for you. Uh, are your solutions used by dealers or factory only? Um, we look for factory uh, primarily over dealerships or like marketing parts of the department. Uh, with these technologies coming out, you can get the little oasises, oases, pluralized mm -hmm. of oasis, popping up throughout different spots because anyone can just get their own VR headset, anyone can then go out and work with another company. So we're finding that dealerships and marketing are kind of doing that. They're figuring out their own niches and we're focusing more on the um, just B2B side throughout the company. Great, all right, so we have another question. I can see performance candidates. Yeah, I think, uh, who wants to take that one? Jay, why don't you take a crack at that one? <laughs> <laughs> I can see performance benefits when using AR in highly varying and complex tasks. Would more repetitive tasks also benefit? Well, every kind of task could benefit because as soon you come into, into a kind of um, standardized environment or in, in a routine, and th these are these repetitive tasks, Routine is always kind of dangerous. As soon you start to feel uh, secure about it, I've done it several times. So there is also a benefit that it reminds you to slow down, to maybe have you also check this. 
in our internal checklist, in our minds, we might skip it because it worked so far. Mm -hmm. So of course, this, this might be also a big benefit that you have this optical checklist where you can't just skip it, where you really have to go through it and it reminds you, oh, there has been something. So of course, yes. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, especially with rote tasks. And, and one of the things we've been looking at, um, you know, is, is kind of looking at productivity using the, um, you know, computer vision uh, within glasses. And we can recognize when a you know, particular individual might be slowing down because they're getting tired. And so we can kind of work with them to optimize their day by having them, you know, give them the suggestion that now would be a time to take a break instead of having them take a break at a set hour. Everyone's biorhythms are a little bit different. Um, there's certainly a philosophical piece to this because we can also, you know, turn the cameras on the eyes and we can do eye tracking because we do need to confirm a lot of times, particularly in unsafe environments, that um, the trainee is, is looking or even the, the worker is actually looking where they're supposed to be looking at a particular time. Um, the challenge there, um, you know, is that it, it, it falls in under medical data. And of course, you know, as you talked about, the, there's a lot of concern around um, how we use data, biometric data. It's really, really uh, challenging to work with, um, and the permissions are going to be a problem. And the regulators right now, what will probably happen in the short term is that this type of data will be over-regulated until we really understand and, and have a function to responsibly use it. So, you know, we'll have to just stay tuned to the space for this. All right, let's uh, get through a couple more questions. Uh, what role did analytics play? and what sort of data is gathered amongst AR. Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about this, but if any of you want to expound a little bit more um, on the analytics piece. I, I would say that the most important part of any project is gathering the data at the very beginning. I'm looking for what your baseline data will be. What are you going to be testing against? And that can be kind of difficult depending on the organization and the type of information that's captured. But it is imperative if you're going to see whether or not the technology is beneficial, you're going to need baseline data. Mm -hmm. And how are you defining, uh, any of you, how are you defining those data points? Because that's another thing. We, you know, we can capture plenty of data. And data just becomes unwieldy. I mean, you know, we work with, you know, there's plenty of data analytics out there, not everyone's using it. You know, the reports are out there, but when you look at, you know, you know the the who they're for, you know, the workforce, they're not always referring to it in the way that we think they are. And now we're just adding another layer of da data on top of it. How are you choosing, you know, what metrics and and how to kind of wire those two sets of KPIs together? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, what what we've done is we we first. Uh, used our learning management system and we've taken a, a look at the test scores that may have come from the more traditionally delivered courses and then we have um, inserted the technology to the course and then see what will fall out on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, that's the easiest way mm -hmm. um, but there are times when that particular data is skewed for one reason or another in which case we look at other types of um, process type reports mm -hmm. as far as inspections and, and things along those lines to see if it's something that we can gauge whether or not the um, technology was beneficial. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Um, would AR not create too much of a tunnel vision approach in some cases? Um, hmm, I don't know, one of you guys, do you wanna take a crack at that? Could you specify more on what that means? Yeah, and tunnel vision, who, anonymous, who asked that? <laughs> do you want to clarify a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> How do you mean? Mm -hmm. 
I think that's a, yeah, so that's a, that is a great question. I think you talked a little bit about um, the user testing, but if you have some ideas on this. Um, this is one that we've run across where with some of our skilled workers where we try to put them in a scenario where it's just following a set of instructions, the, one of the first things they did when we did this was they wanted to jump to step eight. So having it as a linear path, they straight up stopped doing it and said, I don't like this. And one of the things we're looking at is we need to constantly have a way of getting feedback incorporated into systems used so that the people on a job can look at an error and say, all right, I know that the first like five steps of our material that we normally would cover paper-based, computer-based for troubleshooting a problem or going through a process uh, don't need to be happening. I know I should just go to step eight, 10, skip around a bit and solve it a lot quicker. So they kind of are correcting the tunnel vision themselves, but in the way of a new worker, it's a good way to, um, and a lot of the processes that happen in a manufacturing plant are the repetitive ones, so it's good for just getting them through the step one to 10, however many it is, and then once they get more familiar with their job, they can start skipping over those as they need to. And I think we'll see a lot more um, you know, AI uh, mechanisms mm -hmm. sort of on the back end so that we can sort of much more dyna we can dynamically un uh, understand you know, each worker's specific needs and then you know, show them the specific information they need at the right time. Um, and then that is that's definitely sort of a you know a mechanics question like you know where where should it be and you know relative to what they have to be doing but it's it's certainly part of the standardization that we want to look at and it'll be very much vertical specific and some in some cases even task specific. Uh, all right. In your opinion, what's the most powerful experience you can give an enterprise decision maker that XR training is the right choice? We just have to put them in to, to VR most of the cases, and that's actually one of the best, I don't know about you guys, but it's one of the best parts of my job is, is um, putting people through VR for the first time. And I often get you know, very, very busy C-level executives who you know, are very unhappy to be there in the middle of their day. They don't really know why they're there. Um, they've been commanded by somebody, and um, you know, they're already telling me when they need to leave. Um, but but once they go in and they see, so you know, it's hard to say like specifically like one experience. It's really looking at who your audience is going to be, what their um, kind of business role is, and what their over you know their overarching vertical is, and give them experiences that are relevant to that. Um, and it's the same thing like what you do with kids. Like you give them tools, you don't know what they'll come up with. It's the same thing <laughs> with anybody. And you put them in VR for the first time, and you give them just enough of, of you know an experience, and their their brains just start ticking things off, and they're they're coming out of VR with all these incredible ideas about you know how it could be used and, and problems that it could solve. Um, but maybe you guys could speak to some specific experiences as well. Maybe that you've shown some of your executives. Well, I think that what I've used most is the research. I've gone out to find research where that, te that technology was used for a particular type of training and what the results from that particular training yielded. And sometimes it may be it reduced training by 20% or by 40%. Well, you take that number and take it to a decision maker and say, we're training 10,000 employees and the training time will be cut by 40%, which saves this amount of money. And suddenly everyone is really interested in <laughs> enhancing the training with that technology. And are you, um, are any of your executives actually trying and testing the technology or is this oh. all just data-based? They, act, they actually are very active and engaged. They, for the most part, want to see the technology and uh, look for opportunities where they can experience it firsthand. Mm -hmm. And what about Ford? Uh, same with what Mia was saying. We generally uh, have very good executives that like to try things out, see what cutting edge things are, and we see problems that exist. So. A or XR might not be the right choice, but it is a choice. So if we know a problem, we can show this as a possible solution, and they like to see that. And Jay, I know you put a lot of executives through. <laughs> yeah. And we have just a yes. little, little more time well, left. Actually, um, not too much. Dealing, dealing with numbers is a nice thing, but I prefer to use on the one side the wow effect, 
to show them, okay, this is really something amazing, I can really do something. And then afterwards I use the shock effect to show them, especially in training, in these, these, these simulations, how an unexpected situation could look like. So they really are, are confronted with, with something unexpected, what they never would have, but it can happen. And this is something that uh, really shows them the benefit that these guys that are trained not just in standard situations, they can be also exposed into something unexpected, surprising, mm -hmm. let it rain or whatever in, 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 in the middle of a building. Mm -hmm. How will they behave? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point too, that um, e even talking to executives, um, w when you point out to them, you know, if you ask them if they've ever been in an emergency situation, and most of them have, um, and they said, you know, did you, did you react the way you expected? And almost all of them say, well, not exactly. And, and I think that, you know, we individually don't even necessarily know how we're going to behave in, in an emergency situation. And that is one of the, the beauties of training in, um, you know, VR in particular, um, that you can practice over and over and over again. You know, and so you have this kind of reflexive response mechanism in an emergency and you're calm and, and you're actually kind of changing your own behavior with it. So there's incredible value in that. Uh, let's see. Um, given that AR doesn't work in the dark, a digital twin strategy beats the digital overlay thoughts. Digital twin can also be used from classroom to field. True. Are any of you working with any digi doubles or digital twins? No. Not yet? No. Plant deconstruction. Mm -hmm. Yes, I had one simulation um, where there was this, this digital twin of a plant and it looks totally different when everything is just dump it. Uh, where there are no machines in it, where it's dusty, no light, no anything. It looks totally different when you had it before. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this um, doesn't work in the dark. It depends on the, on the, uh, on the sensor that you are using. Um, there are some out there, you have uh, even, even a thermal vision. You have um, these, these um, uh, like, uh, for example, how is it called? Not Kinect, uh, uh, the, the Intel RealSense, where you have uh, this, this deepness information. Mm -hmm. So it also shows you kind, kind of um, the 3D structure of it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of possible, it's, it's, it's just um, a question how you approach with this challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's another great tool. Uh, let's see, uh, VR now, uh, VW announced that they want to train 10,000 employees within XR. How is that driving the industry? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we know who's going to answer this one. <laughs> I know from, from whom Who this, said that? this I do too. question he came. just yes. on my panel. <laughs> I know who's answering that. <laughs> well, especially in automotive, Nearly everyone is, is, is experimenting with uh, XR and is uh, training several thousand guys. Um, it can't be answered that quick. You need um, experience. You need the proper use cases. It's not just that easy um, to put on AR whatever device on and, and just to, to, to let some um, descriptions in a plant go through around. It really needs the proper use cases. So employees can benefit of it mm -hmm. if the right people made the right decision. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that by saying that it really should not be just training to use the technology. It's really the content that needs to be communicated that should drive the technology that's being used for the training. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's another good point. And you know, but but I think it is fair to say that you know between government and automotive, you know that is sort of the driving force behind the industry, um, and and you know all of you within your respective roles and your companies are sort of forging that path. Um, and again, I'll go back to the data. Anything you want to share with us at any point, we'd be very happy to hear. Um, and it sounds like there's no more questions. So uh, it's there, I think the expo hall is open just for a bit longer, maybe 20 minutes. Um, and I would just like to thank uh, everyone from AWE who put together really a pretty incredible conference yet again. And thank all of you for joining us and uh, my fantastic panel.